All right, so good evening and hello to everyone tuning in from across the United States and around the world. Welcome to our second Cities of Tech live podcast event. So this is number two, and this is gonna be a great number two. Uh, today's session features a deep dive into the future of Boston tech and startups. Uh, Boston is a community that uh, I'm really, really interested in, even though I've seen and met uh, so many incredible startups uh, over the past three years uh, going to and from Boston, hearing from the leaders themselves is, is definitely a treat and I'm so happy to have all of you here. I am your host, Brian Antolin, the program manager at Line Run. So um, thank you for tuning in. We are excited to have five incredible community leaders from the Boston tech scene joining us this evening to share their insight and perspective on the future of Boston tech and startups. So they include uh, Kate Broom, Managing uh, Director of Mass Challenge Boston, uh, David Chang, Entrepreneur and Angel Investor, uh, Jason Krauss, Founder and CEO of Prepare for VC and Partner of the EQX Fund, uh, Joyce Sadopoulos, uh, co-founder and vice president of programs and community at Mass Robotics, and Thara Pillai, uh, director of alumni programs and engagement at the Harvard Innovation Lab. So really incredible leaders and can't thank all of you enough again for you know, taking the hour to speak to all of us. Before we jump into uh, our discussion this evening, a little bit about our organization. So Line Run is an experiential career and industry education platform for tomorrow's workforce. We empower our community of leaders to connect, innovate, and grow through media, events, and programs such as this. Uh, we invite all of you to check out linerun.co. So that's L-I-N-E-R-U-N. Um, .co to learn more about our programs, learn more about our classes, and all the different events uh, that we have coming up. So line run. With that, we're going to start our uh, discussion this evening with our one-on-one -on -one spotlights, and we'll go to uh, Kate first. So Kate, your organization, Mass Challenge, is known as one of the global leaders for startup acceleration and support. How has Mass Challenge responded to the new normal brought on by COVID-19 and what concerns have your startups had about building and growing their businesses in Boston? Thank you, Brian, for having us and for the important question. And I'm looking forward to the conversation tonight with my peers and friends across the Boston ecosystem. Uh, so just two seconds, Mass Challenge is a global nonprofit. Our mission is to solve massive challenges through entrepreneurship. And the key engine for our work, as you mentioned, uh, is helping startups launch and grow their businesses through the accelerator programs that we run here in Boston, remains our flagship, but also now around the world. Uh, so Mass Challenge was launched 10 years ago during the Great Recession of 2008, 2009. Our founders had the bold and open ambition of creating a global renaissance of entrepreneurship to drive outsized recovery and job growth. And uh, so this current crisis has us laser focused again on that mission. We know that entrepreneurship goes up in downturns. We know that the inventiveness, the boldness, the resiliency of the founders is essential now to create the solutions uh, that we need for the crisis and to drive recovery. Uh, so we've committed to continue to deliver our programs 100%, if not grow during uh, this COVID crisis. With that said, uh, the new normal, and I don't know that we've even yet reached the new normal, this is day by day learning, is meaningful for, for how we work and operate and for our founders. Uh, as a baseline, we have uh, converted our programs to digital. So we, will can, we are working now with 250 startups, 100 uh, here in Boston, the remainder around the US virtually. We kicked off our 2020 accelerator just two weeks ago. Uh, and we'll be giving them access to the networks and the mentorship and the expertise that they 
need in addition to the introductions within the Boston, the Boston community that we know is so important uh, for the many who want to be building their businesses here. Uh, you know, I think you, you asked specifically about the concerns and the challenges that startups face. Uh, in many ways, um, for the very early stage company, this is a great time for them to be doing customer discovery. So for those that are pre-revenue that are still looking to translate that initial insight into a real product with a real customer, their customers are at times more available now. So we are encouraging them to be hyper proactive in doing that customer research, that outreach into the uh, potential future customers that, that they need to, uh, to continue to develop their businesses. I think the second thing that we know is Boston has long time been a hub for life sciences, enterprise technology, robotics, as you'll hear from, uh, uh, from Joyce. And this is, this is a time where uh, certainly there are macro conditions that make it challenging in general, but there are also tailwinds for those types of businesses who have long development cycles. And so we know that those companies are still coming and turning to the Boston ecosystem for support. They have a long-term timeline and uh, the Boston community has open arms in terms of the work that we're doing to support them. So I'll, I'll pause there and I know my colleagues will, will add to that. Thank you, Kate. And I definitely agree with you. It's, this is a long-term game, especially for startups. And no matter where you are, whether it's Boston or London or New York or wherever it is you're tuning in from, uh, I think keeping that in mind, you know, the long-term orientation and making sure that, like, as you said, keep in touch with your customers, but also understanding how really the ground is shifting below you and being able to adapt that way it, it is crucially important. And an important part of that equation aside from the network and the customers and understanding the environment is capital and love to loop in David next on this. And the pandemic has affected global financial markets and investments far and wide. I think we can all agree on that. Uh, from your perspective, David, how has the pandemic uh, affected the way VCs and angels engage with early stage startups and potential investment opportunities in the greater Boston area? Yeah, I, I think one thing to keep in mind is that the economy itself is not one big monolithic beast, right? There's definitely some sectors, as Kate mentioned, that have some, some tailwinds, right? The telehealth and e-commerce and ed tech in addition to the biotech and, and robotics. And so you want to keep in mind that it doesn't all move in unison. And clearly there's some that are facing headwinds for retail and, and transportation. So keep it in, that in mind and the fact that most investment cycles from the venture capital side are actually buffered by quite a bit. So the typical venture fund raises every three years or so. When they've raised that capital last year, they have to deploy that capital. And so that time horizon is a little bit different. And we're seeing that if you're an early stage entrepreneur, that sure your, your valuation is going to get hit a little bit. In some cases, 10%, other cases, 20, maybe even 30%. So that's just a the nature of sort of supply and demand. But minus that, there are still a ton of investors that are active. In fact, there's, um, there's a couple lists that have been floating around on, on Twitter and posted on Airtable that show which investors are taking meetings, which ones are actively investing. Uh, I'm part of an angel group that we started back in April of all time, so right in the middle of the pandemic. And since April, we've written 10 angel investment checks right in that time period and so that's that's roughly one a week so activity is definitely happening and, and perhaps the advice that i'd give to founders that are considering what to do and how to raise capital is keep in mind you need a longer runway uh you got to figure out whether or not you monetize now versus later uh but but there's definitely capital that's out there and so it's a matter of just making sure that you get in front of the right people and, and pitch what you're doing Definitely so important and being visible and just reaching out and being top of mind, even if that particular investor you're reaching out isn't necessarily open for business right now, but perhaps they'll be able to lend an ear. And also if it is that you're 
really pushing for to raise around uh, refer you out. And I think the most important part is really just reaching out and you know keeping those lines of communication open. I think it's really great that you underline you know the fact that the approach is different, even though it, it's one community, depending on what's going on both on the startup end and the v on the specific VC end, because it, I think it really ties in well with uh, the work that Jason's doing on both sides of the coin. And Jason, you work closely with startups and founders, particularly the ones looking to immediately grow and, and, need, and need capital. So the ones who are you know, on the right track, who are looking for that boost. How have local startups adapted or shifted their growth and funding strategies over the past few months? And what does that mean for the greater community in the long run? Yeah, I think um, there's been a couple really good points on this already. Um, I think, you know, obviously it's been challenging for a lot of startups, but on the other hand, there's been some um, either some some companies are doing pivots some i think are doing more like what i like to call twists and just you know there's something they can go after in the short term um still have their main goal and business plan that they're going after in the long term but there is um something they can do to adapt and continue to grow during this period um i think the main challenge or main challenge at the beginning was um sort of shifting the mindset on the investment side that like normally, you know, an investor is not going to go into a deal where they haven't met and spent a lot of time with the founders. Um, and now sort of, I feel like, or I've seen, um, you know, a lot of investment groups shifting the mindset and being pretty active on new deals um, and sort of like considering, basically virtual meetings, um, you know, the bot or I'm involved with the Boston Harbor Angels group, we've shifted all of our monthly, uh, like screening and investment meetings online. And it's still, um, you know, a great way to meet new companies. Um, some of the funding strategies have shifted a little bit to offering like, either you know, doing um, with some uncertainty, like doing more convertible notes uh, that can convert into the next round or offering warrants and other incentives to bring investors in right now where normally they might have waited to see um, how the pandemic pans out and how long the effects are going to last. That's great. And, and, you know, just hearing about how everything is really come together and, and, and shifting based on, you know, what the effects are macro on a high level every day, it, I think it is really important. And also for companies who uh, are in that mode and seeing that, you know, it is not necessarily business as normal, but things are happening. It's just a matter of, uh, as we talked about with, with David having those discussions. Shifting gears a bit, uh, an innovation-driven ecosystem is really the sum of it, the individual parts, from talent to leadership uh, to capital. And Boston, at least in my opinion, has this incredible advantage in its commitment to deep tech and resources to support those types of innovations. And one, one such resource is uh, the organization that Joyce co-founded, Mass Robotics. And Joyce would love to hear more about uh, how you see the robotic scene in greater Boston, how it's changed over the past few years and specifically now uh, after, well, during and after COVID and where you see mass robotics fitting in in the long term. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for having me. Can you hear me? You're making a face. No, okay. So we bring together um, startups and existing technology companies and, and provide entrepreneurs resources um, and the facilities they need to grow and be successful. So um, unlike, you know, we are not an incubator or an accelerator. We love when, when our companies come out of a mass challenge um, because we know they have a good foundation and they have good resources and mentors. So our companies are really at all different stages. We take companies right out of the university who kind of need resources and, and, and robotics is a hardware intensive 
um, you know, kind of technology. And so resources as far as robot arms or ground mobile devices or the software licenses you need to actually um, innovate and, and, um, and build something or, or organize something. Oh, I see a poll camp come up. <laughs> So, um, so, so we, we support these, these startups um, and advocate and help them find actually uh, resources, even talent. Um, and so we do this by, we host an investor demo day. Um, and so we invite the investors in the community in. Um, we have a lot of signature events, which are very vertically focused on a particular industry. So we do a robotics and defense event, a robotics and manufacturing, a robotics and um, logistics and construction. And we bring in the companies that actually have um, challenges in certain areas. And, and then we have our startups who, who can solve those problems, talk to them and kind of, it's a mashup of the needs with, with the technology that can support those needs. So, um, you know, the way we've, we've seen the, the ecosystem grow or, or robotics grow in Massachusetts, um, it was just five, eight years ago when, when I was, you know, gathering the robotics companies to meet um, quarterly or bi-monthly, um, and there were probably a dozen to 20 companies who would get together every other month. And they had super cool technology, but they didn't have a lot of customer focus, um, and there weren't a lot of resources out there to kind of help them. Um, and I'd say by 2015, when we were really starting up Mass Robotics, there were probably 80 to 100 companies coming to those meetings. And so it kind of just took off. And, and part of that is, I think, um, private industry was realizing the need for robotics and automation if we wanted to keep up with the rest of the world. Um, but also, you know, we had places like Mass Challenge. Um, and then we had investors that were, were slowly warming up to the idea of really long, um, long lead times and, and, you know, eight years for really a return on investment. And I, and I think slowly the investor community is, is catching up with these tough tech kind of um, kind of companies. So, you know, where we fit in is where we're in the middle of, we are a shared workspace, but we are very vertically focused in robotics technology. Um, and we are more of an escalator, we call ourselves. So not an incubator, an accelerator, but an escalator. And we help these companies find manufacturers, find customers, find, um, you know, VC backing. Um, and I'd say coming out of the pandemic, robotics is super strong. So last year, um, in just Massachusetts, there was about $1.4 billion of investment going to just, mass robo just robotics in Massachusetts companies. Um, this year, at the end of June, we were over 700 million. So we're, we're tracking you know, about the same. Um, but I think that uh, a lot of larger companies are seeing that robotics is a way to um, help with social distancing. I think they're, they're realizing that um, you have to have less human touch and how can robots help there? Um, delivery systems, cleaning, telepresence, um, you know, these are all uh, challenges that are solved with robotics. So um, while Mass Robotics closed during the pandemic, a few of our companies were deemed as mission essential because they were in the, the manu manufacturing supply chain um, area or they were, in, they were defense related. So our doors kind of stayed open and, and we've adopted policies um, clean in, clean out, temperature, you know, all the typical things, mask wearing. So, you know, we're open. And since April, we've had five new companies join. So companies are still joining and they're realizing that there is a value to, uh, you know, being part of, of the ecosystem here and, and having the resources that really Boston has to offer. So happy to hear that you know, all the really incredible work that you're doing is being recognized and also that the companies are, are finding uh, really good results themselves. And I definitely think that the, the fact that Boston has this real wealth of resources and, and connections and just this uh, community, and you described it as more of a town than a city uh, in the way that it functions, it, it definitely speaks to uh, the results that we're seeing from our first snap poll in terms of uh, the number one factor you would, that would influence you as a startup to start re relocate or grow your venture. And um, it's access to talent and a supportive community. And I think that definitely speaks to uh, Boston's strengths. And uh, doubling down on what you mentioned, Joyce, and 
uh, really transitioning into um, a discussion about the role, the really important role that universities play. Love to bring up Dara and her work over at Harvard. And, you know, startup programs in universities are, are really unique because of the in person access to knowledge, talent, and resources and uh, especially uh, an ecosystem a a as large and well-renowned as Harvard, I can imagine. Uh, how have you and your team at Harvard been able to translate those factors, the things that really make it work as an in-person uh, community and organization? How have you been able to translate that and activate those su support systems remotely? So um, I work at the Harvard Innovation Labs. It's um, a place where we support um, any Harvard student from any Harvard school throughout their entrepreneurial journey. Um, we are a three lab ecosystem today. So we have um, the innovation labs, which support the students. We have the life lab, which is a wet lab space um, for life science ventures. And then I uh, oversee and run a launch lab XGO, which is our alumni program. Um, and like all universities and accelerators in this town, I think we transitioned very quickly. You know, we moved everything to Zoom. Um, David, who's here, um, did one of our, you know, early uh, Zoom sessions. Um, and, you know, it's been great. They've been very well attended. In fact, you know, um, if we had gone virtual or I included virtual sessions a year ago, I'm not sure if I would have uh, almost 100% attendance from my participants. What is sad about this whole state of affairs, though, is if you've been to the innovation labs, um, you know, I always joke, we spend this much, you can't see my hand with the background, but this much on staff and this much on snacks. Um, and the reason why we spend so much on snacks is that so much um, intentional serendipity happens in our kitchen and so much cross collaboration happens in our kitchen. Um, you know, I hear students and alumni connect all the time. What are you working on? I'm working on this. Oh, hey, have you spoke to this person? Oh, yeah, you should, we should connect on this. Like, oh, I'm actually, there are so many great moments um, that happen in the iLab. Like, literally every 10 to 20 seconds around me, I hear students connecting, which is phenomenal. Now that we've moved online, which happened relatively smoothly, I am forced to build those connections, build community, build culture. Um, and it is challenging. So a program, um, we had an in-residence alumni program um, that ran for the last line, nine months at, at the um, iLab and we just wrapped that up and we had migrated to an online model, worked very well. But those alumni had the opportunity to connect and meet and build relationships with each other before um, we moved into this virtual world. Flash forward for the fall, I'm building a global virtual program now with alumni from around the globe, which is really exciting. Um, but my focus, you know, putting the programming together is the easy part. The value that the Innovation Labs brings is building those personal human connections. So, you know, a lot of my time is spent figuring out how am I going to get people to collaborate and work in small groups together? We do alumni circles and founder forums. So, you know, people are raw and candid and share openly, but it helps if they've spent, you know, several dinners together. Um, they've built some rapport between each other. They know like what pets each other owns or, you know, if they, they grew up in this hometown or like these types of foods or into laser tag or whatever it is. So, you know, all of a sudden now we have to build those connections and force community to happen. And so, you know, we've done a lot of experimentation. I have to say my colleagues have been amazing at this and I've talked to different companies in the Boston area. I mean, some of them are having exercise classes in the morning. Um, we do trivia night, we have drinks nights, we, you know, we force people or encourage people to meet in smaller groups, check in on your colleagues and find out how they're doing. Um, and so moving forward to the fall, you know, a lot of my time is spent like with icebreaker games, like how am I going to get people to share? How am I going to get people in Singapore to connect with people from San Francisco um, and build meaningful connections? So I think it is going to be really challenging. I think I have my work cut out for me, um, but I think, you know, 
there's so much happening and evolving in terms of the tech sector and people coming up with new ideas in terms of fostering those relationships. I, I feel confident that we can make it happen. Definitely, and I, I could definitely feel your, uh, that uh, frustration and the way that trying to build community and try to force it rather than it being organically, just seeing people around and then uh, having conversation that way where you're trying to facilitate things. It, it's definitely a different dynamic and it takes a long time to get used to for sure. But I also believe that having this particular event happen and forcing us to adapt also will prove beneficial in the long term because we're able to really understand you know meat and potatoes what's actually important and what's really going on so we really appreciate that perspective from our directed takes we're going to move uh, towards a more panel discussion forum and learn more from our panelists about the overall state of the community uh, Love to ask first, you know, a lot of opinions shared over the past few weeks regarding Boston's future as a center for business and commerce. Uh, good, bad, a lot of opinions overall. Um, how would you describe the current state of Boston's tech industry and how does it bounce back from this disruption? And I think we'll go to David first. Yeah, you know, I think bouncing back is one of the things that people in the Boston area do particularly well. And I can say that um, maybe because I'm not a Boston native, I'm originally from New York and coming up here thinking that New England and be a fun place to spend two years and two years turned into 20. And one thing I've seen here is that the, the ability for you to take the underdog position and kind of rise up uh, above that is, is a core strength, right? And that's kind of what startups are about, right? You're up against an incumbent, you're up against something big. And so I think to bounce back as an industry, you build on some of the core strengths that already exist, right? So whether it's a core advantage that you have around biotech or robotics, you know, it's a natural advantage. And so you want to build on top of that. And then there's all these other industries where given the pandemic, there is a disruption in the business. The disruption in the business itself is one where it doesn't last forever. And what you want to try to figure out is, what is something that will remain permanent, like a structural change that will forever be different, right? Let's just use um, telecommuting as an example, right? And so we should jump on top of that because the, despite wherever the world's going, telecommunications will, be, will play a bigger part going forward. Now, when the world returns back to a little bit more of a normal state, you know, the balance might be a little bit different, but it is structurally different. So there are industries where you absolutely now have a leg up, right? Because maybe it would have taken you two years to get to that point. You're suddenly there uh, in three months, right? And so focus on those aspects. And, and for the industries or for the entrepreneurs that are in industries where you face significant headwinds, I think in those cases, you've got to figure out how to reinvent that, like what you're doing or what you're doing within that industry, maybe partner with some other adjacent area where there's some strength, but build upon that so that you can pull these two pieces together and, and do something that's different. And so I think in, in many cases, disruption is actually your friend. David, I think I'll, I'll just um, build on that point about resiliency in the Boston area um, and, you know, make a, a couple key points. First is like certainly the tech industry here and the entrepreneurs face meaningful challenges. I think there's, even where there are opportunities, the day-to-day -day operations, the hiring, the fundraising environment, the personal uh, effect of the pandemic is, is really meaningful. And then particularly if we look at the industries that are faced, that are hardest hit. With that said, is I think that there's optimism for Boston in not only because of the resiliency in you know, our Northeast uh, cold blood, but also because many of the industries that we have strengthened, I think will continue to be absolutely critical going forward. And you're seeing industry, you're seeing government turn to our innovators for solutions. You think of the government looking to buoy health for help with symptoms tracking. You think of Ginkgo Bioworks churning its platform to drive to not only you know, produce uh, new materials, but also to 
to take on diagnostics. And, and so everywhere from digital health to fintech, uh, to life sciences, to robotics are areas that Massachusetts has not only been a leader in has, but intentionally investing in building those clusters over the past decade. And they're now at a point where there's accelerating sense of urgency for innovation. And so entrepreneurs have an opportunity to break through some of the, uh, the adoption issues, the you know, legacy industry uh, type hesitations uh, to really scale their businesses. So in that way, I think there's optimism uh, for Boston as an epicenter of technology. Some of the, the concerns are around, you know, do people need to come to Boston if, uh, if you can telecommute? Do you need, if schools are gonna change, will, will students come here and what does that mean for talent? Uh, I think realistically, no one knows long-term how dramatically this will shift, as David said, the sort of true nature of work. Uh, I think the, the academic literature around the benefits of like density, and particularly in these really hands-on industries like robotics and life sciences, or areas where there's breakthroughs happening like AIML, that cluster of activity and the brains working together will continue to be important. And so we will see people coming to Boston still to do that work together, even as we embrace hopefully new efficient ways of working together. Jason, interested in what you're seeing? Yeah, um, no, I love all the points that, yeah, you and David had so far on that. Um, and I think, you know, definitely seeing, or so seeing a lot of the areas that, um, or there's been investment in, or like as companies, um, you know, that are adding new lines of business or tapping into other areas they haven't looked into before. Um, I think also, you know, even the traditional businesses that aren't startups um, are now becoming more tech enabled business and open to new technology. So like, if you look at, um, you know, the restaurant industry, for example, every, uh, all the businesses that never had online ordering or never had all these other automated systems have started using the technology, mostly coming from other startups in the area. Um, same with healthcare, like, um, you know, telehealth has been around for a while, but it's been slow to adopt before the pandemic here. And, um, you know, we have a great healthcare system in Boston and um, a lot of the startups are enabling the like the hospital systems, the restaurants, and other you know businesses that um, that startups can now help with. Definitely, and it, it definitely seems that you know it, it's a constantly evolving situation. I I definitely think that uh, you know no matter where you are, that will be the case, and I think this really brings up a great point on where we see Boston going because uh, at least from my perspective as an outsider, uh, I, I see Boston uh, thriving in, in several areas, particular, particularly in applications uh, of deep tech, such as uh, biotech and, and robotics. And how does the ecosystem change or evolve, if at all, over the next few years beyond these core strengths that people know and recognize Boston as being a leader in. So I think we'll start with Joyce. Yeah, because um, you know, we, we really are known as a leader in AI, ML, just from the universities that are here, but also robotics. Um, you know, I only see it getting stronger in that area. And that's not, and I would say that's not just because of the pandemic, but because of the pandemic, you know, a lot of these uh, companies need something to clean, something to take out the trash, something to deliver, you know, deliver groceries. The, you know, the telepresence is also, um, we actually have telepresence robots here that I used way before the pandemic. And I, I did it to check up on weekends to make sure that the boys here were cleaning up after themselves. So there's all, <laughs> there's all different ways to use, um, use robotics, but, you know, um, we have a, a robot here from an HSR, a human, um, human service robot from Toyota. And they're using these robots to, um, to help keep the aging in place. So, you know, we're an aging population um, and that's another application for robotics. But robotics in construction is, is one of the, 
the big um, series that we're running this this fall. And you know, it makes it a safer a safer type of uh, vertical industry. So you know, you you won't have swinging cranes anymore. We actually have an apparatus that can sit on the crane and can counterbalance the wind. Um, surveying, you don't have to go out and set up your little tripods anymore. We have a robot that can do that. And so it it is helping um, manufacturing, especially um, some of the projects we've done earlier this year with Northeastern and the fish processing. Um, seeing everybody lined up shoulder to shoulder, sifting through scallops when you have you have computers and you have cameras and you have you know AI that can actually tell you where the, the scallop is with with the uh, the little shell. And so I think it's going to be uh, you know a lot of the manufacturers that we've visited over the past uh, couple of years, their population and their employees are probably 50% are at the retirement level. And so how do these factories continue if there's no people coming to the factories to work? And if you look at the workers and you talk to them, they're working there so their kids don't have to work there. And so their their kids are getting into tech. So, um, you know, the way I see everything shifting is, you know, it starts with education and, and educating our youth to, to understand these technologies, right? Um, and they adopt them so much easier than we do. Um, and so I think the whole shift from the ground up is is moving towards this technology and robotics. And I, I um, you know, the question was more around how do we build off our core strengths, but I think the core strengths are the, the actual basics of, let's say, you know, in my, in my case, robotics, the basics of how do you take in information, how do you calculate it, and actuate something. So really a robot is sensing, you know, computing and actuating. And so we have all of those things here. Um, it, you know, I, it's very tough to be remote when you're work, working robotics because you have to physically be seeing the thing move um, and you have to be tweaking and, and testing. And so um, I think that's really tough. And, and you know, what you were saying, Farah, on, on a getting together over lunches, it's, it's very hard to be remote when you have all of these like minds coming together at lunch, talking, and when you see people in the lab helping each other. It doesn't happen when you're remote. And so, um, you know, we, we have to figure out how to find a cure for this and an immunization so this doesn't happen again. <laughs> because I really think people need to be social and, and it's just how things happen. So biotech companies be working. <laughs> That's, that's, you know, so that, that's how I see, I, I see robotics as really just, this is, this was an accelerator. Um, and the startups that have, that are in our space have really, um, it's kind of helped them focus more and see, the, see a need and see a niche where they could find a solution. So it, it's matching, you know, the need with the, with the technology. And I think there's a lot of need out there now. So that's it yeah. for me. <laughs> You know, I, I look at um, how my mind was um, back in March, and I remember thinking about my young alumni companies, wondering how many of them were going to survive over the next, like, the coming months. I have to say, all of them are thriving and doing exceptionally well. I think this pandemic has hyper-accelerated opportunities that weren't there before. So you look at the robotics cleaning space, you know, um, trying to get a pilot in, you know, a hotel or whatever would have taken probably months or, you know, the sales cycle or whatever would have taken months um, to happen. And all of a sudden people are willing to try new things, right? We had a company who was working in the restaurant space doing text and voice messaging to do order delivery. Um, you know, they had a slow but healthy ramp up. This has hyper accelerated them. So, you know, in terms of the tech companies at the innovation labs, I'd say probably 90% of them um, have morphed and advanced in this COVID environment, which is great to see. What I do find frightening, and I don't think anyone's paying enough attention to, is a huge tech discrepancy gap that's happening between our tech advanced companies and our small retailers, our small restaurants. You know, we look at real estate now. How is that going to impact how our downtown core is going to grow and be vibrant in the future? And I think those are the things that we need to focus our attention on right now because I think that trickle down effect is going to come and it's going to come with a punch. And none of us are going to realize it's even happening. 
Um, you know, I work very closely with our small um, independent businesses and the town that I live in. They're all hurting right now. They all got loans there, but they don't know how to apply them. They, they have access to technology. They don't know how to apply it. You know, they're just trying to keep their businesses running from day to day. I mean, I think, you know, the tech industry has a huge opportunity here to maybe channel some of that goodwill they've gotten um, to maybe some of those smaller industries where, you know, they don't have those support systems in place so we can close that technology gap. And the same thing's happening in education. You know, Massachusetts is a relatively wealthy state in comparison to others. You know, I think we're still fairly lucky, even though, you know, people complain about online learning. You know, most kids here have access to computers through their school systems. That's not the case around, across the country. Um, so I would encourage people to think about our core strengths, but look outwards and see how we can support people beyond our borders. I think this is a really important point, and it's one that uh, came up recently in our Mass Challenge Board of Advisors meeting, which is precisely this point around the entrepreneurship that's happening historically on the street corners. And so first of all, the extraordinary pressure, pressures they're under, but then also the innovation that's happening. And it may be it's time for the tech startups down in the seaport to be thinking more broadly about our community, which includes the business owners and the entrepreneurs who are operating the businesses we all depend on and who have been creative uh, in the face of this and who also need resources that we've been driving towards the startup. So I, uh, I am hopeful that we may see a coming together in the, in the future between these historically two sets of entrepreneurs. Um, the other uh, aspect, which I, I hope that Boston will keep at the forefront as we move forward is uh, the uh, inequity and in many cases, systemic racism that's been uh, visible through uh, COVID and then also the killing of George Floyd. And I think that's spurred a very necessary conversation within the tech community broadly and then also within Boston around equity, access to resources, representation. There are some extraordinary organizations that have lived and worked within our communities of colors for years. And uh, the urgent necessity is to make sure that we actually create pathways for entrepreneurs to grow their businesses into the innovation district and for the innovation district to be working within those communities of color. So I know Mass Challenge has been looking hard at uh, our data, our practices, our team to make sure that that's uh, essential, an essential part of what we're doing going forward. And I think that's shared within the Boston tech community more broadly. Definitely. And I love the fact that you all touched on really important things. And just to bring up the results of our latest uh, poll, um, from what you know about the community, how would you best describe the Boston tech and startup scene? I think most of you would be very happy to know that a wonderful reputation of being this powerhouse with the support of mentor and peer community. And I, I think uh, it's a credit to all of you and the really incredible work that you all do to, to really foster those relationships and, and help uh, startups and people who work with startups thrive in, in this environment, especially what's going on now. So I think that's really wonderful. Uh, if we were to extrapolate on, on a high level and, and try to help convince some of the other folks who don't necessarily see Boston in the same light, if you were to pitch uh, a startup or a scale up to launch or relocate their operations to Boston uh, in the next 18 months, what would be your top three reasons for them to do so? Uh, Jason, we'll go to you first. Sure. Um, yeah, I think, you know, one of the top reasons is going to be that access to the mentoring and advisory um, that you're that, yeah, that we've been talking about. So, and I think, you know, the channels to get that, obviously, like, you know, there's traditional advisors for startups, like bring somebody, bringing somebody on your board of advisors, but there's also all these other channels through, like, through the programs like Mass Challenge and other accelerators we have in Boston, um, you know, the Mass Robot, or it depends on what industry you guys are involved in, you know, finding, I think the nice thing about Boston is you can kind of find um, a group that fits best with whatever your startup is working on and and the um, 
particular challenges or opportunities you might be facing. Um, so yeah, I mean, anything that's like within a specific technology vertical or healthcare, life sciences are really the main strength, but there's also been some great uh, consumer brands that have developed here as well. Um, so yeah, that's definitely one aspect I'd focus on. Also just the, mi uh, the mindset overall, like being able to find co-founders, teammates, employees, um, you know, that have the same attitude of like putting everything into their startup and um, sort of making it like, basically pe you can find people that like make the vision that you have the same as theirs and work with you towards the success of the company. Um, and then, yeah, I'd say the last part is just, uh, you know, a willingness to adopt, um, adopt new technology. And like, I think we're more open to change, uh, than a lot of other cities. And, you know, we see, um, yeah, whether it's like implementing technology in your business or just being, um, I mean, yeah, like, uh, you know, the comment, definitely bringing it back to um, the diversity aspect there, like, you know, th um, it hasn't just started in Boston. I mean, obviously it started, um, I will, uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's an area like that luckily we're seeing a lot more businesses focused on here that, you know, definitely it's a time we need to change, like build out more of a diverse team, um, diverse like funding between different startups. And also, um, you know, especially even just thinking like within the customers you guys are serving, um, if, you know, if you have a broad spanning customer base, you don't want the same um, group of people like making all the decisions for your company. You want to come to uh, you know, a place where you can find, um, you know, people with maybe different backgrounds and different opinions that you can bring into the business and, um, you know, make everyone or make the company stronger because of that diversity. Maybe I'll just, um, add to that a little bit. One, one thing that I think we all know from Startup Land is focus is key. And for you to win, you've got to be laser focused on a particular goal in mind. And so if I apply that to Boston, we do have certain muscles that are really strong here. And I'm not going to repeat in everything that we've, we've shared. But if you're a founder or an entrepreneur or head of a company that's thinking about either growing, scaling, or starting here, I think the thing you got to keep in mind is that because not all these muscles are fully developed in the space and the problem that you're solving. It's really key to find this magic intersection of where in the industry that you're focused on, that the talent is here and the talents of the people from universities, the pillar company veterans, the customer base, maybe it's like a manufacturing base or the partner base uh, or a big company that may eventually acquire the company. And so there's a lot about talent. And so that's one key ingredient. Ingredient number two clearly is, capital to grow, right? And so that, that I think is increasingly being um, distributed. So capital can be coming from any, any place. And, uh, and the final ingredient is the ecosystem, right? So everyone on this call have engaged in efforts to try to connect different parts of the ecosystem. And so if you're in a space or you're solving a problem that has those three things and you can combine them in a, in a magical way, then it's a fantastic place. And I firmly believe there's a bunch of different places where you can, or there's a bunch of different fields where you can do that within Boston. I think the, the key here is to try to figure out whether or not your particular problem that you're solving is the ecosystem truly supportive. And, and you know, I've heard from a bunch of other folks that have never been to Boston before when they first get in here, get here that it's hard for them to find their circle and open up the circles. And it was a shocking statement that someone had shared with me because I, you know, I, think, I, I think the world of Boston, I think it's super open. I think everyone's so accessible, but for the newcomer, it, it requires that little extra push for them to get into those circles. It might be a circle of you know, talent, talented people in a particular field. It might be a circle of just uh, other people who don't look like you. Uh, and, and so 
without that, that extra push that this ecosystem provides, then you're not going to be able to succeed. And so I, I think that there, there's, there's a lot of great stuff about being here. And for founders that, again, are thinking about coming here, make sure you have those three things and you're doing it for the right reasons. Definitely. It's always really helpful to be very purposeful in, in your actions and in your planning and how you really go about your business moving forward from there. So very insightful. Thank you very much. Uh, we're going to move towards our uh, audience questions now, and we're going to start with Lynn's. Uh, why is uh, the Boston startup scene so far behind other areas in the country in reference to the robust social entrepreneurship ecosystem, specifically B Corps? So I think uh, Dara, you wanted to uh, uh, chime in uh, and answer Lynn. Yeah, you know, and I can only speak from my personal experience at the Harvard Innovation Labs, but what's an interesting statistic about our space is that um, a large percent of, a percentage of our founders are creating impact ventures, um, which wasn't the case even three to five years ago. Um, those numbers have dramatically changed and um, you know, I have to say, I think it's like the mindset of that generation. Um, when I talk to people who are working on ventures um, and I, you know, we talk about business model and, you know, they can clearly um, commercialize what they're doing um, and leverage their technology or their science. Most of them are like, oh, I just want to do this for the greater good of people. And, you know, it's amazing to see that type of spirit. Um, and that sort of mindset um, coming out of our ecosystem. Um, you know, I think Harvard has a reputation sometimes of, you know, um, spinning out um, investment bankers and uh, um, McKinsey consultants. Um, and, you know, we, we have those people who are doing great work as well, but, you know, it's a very, um, diverse group um, community and we recently hosted an online demo day with about 30 teams. Um, we had about 4,000 plus views of their um, pitch decks and, um, and many of them were impact ventures. In fact, the top four teams that received the most introductions to investors, um, two of them were impact ventures. So, you know, the tide is changing. I think investors are looking um, uh, to diversify their portfolio and looking at um, investing in different ways. We had one founder who is based in, um, her ventures based in Ghana. Um, she said, Tara, you know, last year when I participated, I got a couple of introductions. This year I participated and I got 10 um, from top tier VCs. Um, she goes, that never would have happened last year. So I do think the tide is changing. And so, you know, um, important to remain optimistic. And I think the Boston area is changing in particular. And I can add just a couple stats from the uh, Mass Challenge view, which is, uh, so we support about 100 companies a year in our Boston cohort. Since our founding, between 8 and 10% of those are self-identified social enterprise companies vary between nonprofit, for-profit, benefit corp, or undecided. Um, with that said, 30% uh, of the companies in this year's cohort would self-identify as sustainability focused. And 80% of our companies were able to self-identify with one of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. So I think the reason I mention that is there are some companies that from a business perspective, from a founder philosophy perspective, from a market perspective, want to lead with impact uh, and the social enterprise tag. Other founders, the mission is in their core, but they want to be commercial. And so they will make different choices as to how explicit the ultimate impact is in their, their business. And we think that's okay, because at the end of the day, we want them to be out there scaling their business in the way that lets them have the largest impact. So, you know, I, I mentioned that only because there is a really a robust ecosystem of companies here in Massachusetts. Many of them are in the life science space, but many are not, um, I think. And we have a great ecosystem of actors, the Harvard iLab Solve at MIT. Brandeis has an incredible social enterprise program that our 
uh, really active ecosystems for social entrepreneurs. Wonderful. Um, be hopeful. Yes, be hopeful. And, and also, I think it's really important to, again, reach out and, and ask around if you don't see uh, something right away. Uh, definitely someone in the community will, will be able to help guide you and be uh, very willing to do so. Uh, next, we're going to go to Suja Roy's question about um, how the Boston area is positioned uh, for a last mile on delivery demand business. So I think Joyce, you wanted to respond to him. Sure. Um, it seems like there's a there's a lot of questions within that question, but um, so um, you know we have Amazon Robotics here, of course. That's in house warehouse in house or in warehouse um, sorting and and packaging, um, and we probably have half a dozen off the top of my head who are in a similar market where they're working for different companies to actually do the the shelf to box piece of it. Um, and then there's probably a half a dozen that are doing the take the box off the truck and deliver everything from a drone company to a, a ground mobile. And there's a couple of different ones. David, we just talked about one that was that was here in Boston uh, a couple of years ago at Mass Robotics. Um, and so uh, I know in our area, in the Seaport area, we're in um, an autonomous vehicle test zone. So if there was, if you're interested in coming to Boston because you want to test that last mile delivery, um, this is an area that's been sanctioned um, autonomous vehicle safe or testing or so we have a couple different autonomous vehicle companies in the seaport that are kind of driving around us. So if I wasn't sure if that was the question or if they meant is it um, is it to scale your company and, and the need for manufacturers to to make these kinds of uh, robots because Massachusetts has 8000 manufacturers in the state alone, everything from the small mom and pop shop CNC machines to the contract manager or the contract manufacturer, which puts the, um, the whole robot together. So, um, and, and Mass MEP is a, a great resource as well. They're the, the manufacturing extension program. Um, every state has one. I know Massachusetts is very strong. We have a manufacturing month um, in October. Um, so I wasn't sure if, I'm hoping that answers your question. You can type in a reply, right? Yes, um, I, I think you covered most of the bases there. Um, Richard has a really interesting question, especially uh, with what's going on uh, with the latest government guidance. Um, I think Dar, you wanted to uh, chime in on how this new regulation and how uh, the changes for uh, students in particular, uh, how it affects uh, folks that you work with? So I, yeah, it was, I think, devastating news for most um, uh, colleges and institutions in the Boston and Massachusetts ecosystem. Um, you know, having that diversity um, of mindsets um, and geographical experiences are really um, at the heart of what we do at the Innovation Lab. So having that restriction in place was like, you know, um, a real blow to us. Having said that though, um, you know, we have become more accessible in a way, even though we have this sort of community culture connection piece that's um, much harder to make happen. The one thing I've heard from students is, you know, I can actually, um, take part in more office hours. You know, I, I used to, I work over at the medical school or I work over at the law school and, you know, I don't have to run across campus to make my office hour meeting with a mentor. I don't have to, you know, um, cancel, step out, skip out of class early to get over to the iLab. I mean, now they can just zoom in, which is great. And I mean, I talk to students um, every day from all parts of the globe, which I didn't do before. And, you know, we start off the conversation just asking, like, where are you? Where are you living right now? What are you doing? And what's it like over there? And I mean, that has been great for me. Um, so, you know, I think while I was devastated by the news, I think, you know, we'll find a way to make the best out of this. And hopefully we can expand access um, to those students so they can fully participate in our programming moving forward. Yeah, I just wanted to add and touch on that as well. Um, I think, 
you know, and so from my uh, consulting and advisory company, Prepare for VC, like we had, um, you know, an intern we got over the summer that normally, um, you know, uh, she's an MBA student at BU, um, went back to China for the summer or basically, you know, when all the classes were canceled um, and yeah, like the normal internships that everyone was going after weren't around. Um, so, you know, we've never taken an intern before, but, um, you know, we decided it would be a great time to bring on somebody virtually that we can work with. And, you know, we have um, go-to meetings every, uh, yeah, every week go over some tasks and like, you know, she's been great so far with us and in something that we might not have like considered bringing somebody else in if, uh, yeah, w without the current situation. But I think, um, you know, it can expand, it can even expand like, you know, long term. I know Twitter um, said all their employees can be remote from, from now on. And a lot of other businesses are starting to be more open to like bringing people in no matter what location you're in um, and still adapting that within their, like within their, um, you know, long-term strategy for the business. Uh, while there's going to be some people like working in the office, especially, um, you know, some of the areas we mentioned, like it helps to have people, um, you know, in a place for robotics and other industries. Um, there's still like access to talent from, other areas you can tap into, you know, as needed to fill in, uh, to fill in the gaps. Yeah, it, it's a fluid situation, of course. And I, I think what, um, it, it's something that a lot of companies and a lot of organizations and, and colleges really aren't in control of, but we'll, we'll find a way to work around and, and make it work for uh, most, if not everyone in some way, shape or form. Um, before we let all of you go, just want to share the results from uh, our, our last poll about the number one thing Boston needs to do in order to attract and retain more early and growth stage tech companies. And it appears that uh, actively promoting its strengths uh, is the number one thing and then followed by access to grants and loans for startups so everyone, can, everyone always can use money and uh, greater access to support resources. So I believe through the conversation, we were able to see and understand that uh, this situation has brought more access to people uh, that they wouldn't normally have had in, in uh, pre-COVID time. So definitely uh, an interesting opportunity that a lot of you should take advantage of uh, right now if you haven't uh, already. Uh, so this concludes our uh, discussion this evening on the future of Boston Tech and startups. I think this was a really wonderful discussion and I'm really happy to, that all of you were able to share your really incredible insights and you know, can't thank all of you enough. And uh, for those of you who are tuning in live or who are going to be watching this, um, we will be making uh, everyone's uh, LinkedIn profile uh, available to you in the, next, in the coming days so you can connect with them directly if you haven't done so already. Uh, one last thing before we wrap up. So uh, from here, we're taking a nice long road trip down to Austin uh, in two weeks, and we're going to be exploring the Austin tech scene down in Texas. Um, we have uh, two really incredible speakers confirmed so far, Lisa Besserman from the Global uh, Incubator at Indeed and uh, Jill Klinvex from the Capital Factory. So uh, really great stuff coming up uh, over in the next week. And then uh, later in the month, we are doing um, different sessions on artificial intelligence. So for those of you interested in AI, definitely check that out. So address is linerun.co backslash events. Uh, again, really happy that all of you were able to uh, join us this evening. Thank you so much to all of our panelists, uh, David, Kate, Joyce, Jason, Dara. Thank you so much for sharing all of your incredible knowledge. Uh, for those of you watching, thank you so much for tuning in. And uh, remember, uh, connect with everyone 
reach out. Everyone is willing to have some type of discussion. If they can't help you directly, they can always refer you out. And definitely this group here that, that we have uh, assembled uh, is more ready and willing to do that. So thank you all again, really appreciate it. And we'll see you next time. Thank you. That was great.